Hey, and so yeah, welcome to uh, the latest episode of the Be Better podcast. And with me today, I have got uh, Richie Jones from Vast. Hello, Richie. How's it going? Yeah, good. How's it going, Tim? You all right? I'm doing really good. Yeah. And so obviously, we were just trying to work out whether we are related on, on some level, possibly, although your family, um, you were saying, uh, for, the, for, for people who know nothing, nothing about Wales, we'll give them a quick introduction. So your family would obviously be called Gogs in uh, in Welsh, because people from North Wales uh, speak differently to people in South Wales. So um, yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, and, and, and to make it even worse, I'm sort of I'm half Welsh, and the other half of me is English. So when yeah, the exactly. rugby's on, it causes some challenges, you know. Yes, you I'm, I'm, just go with whoever's winning, you know. The <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm exactly the same i went to university in cardiff as well which probably made it even worse and um okay. so i was always called a plastic taff because you you know you're not quite the real thing um but yes you know, yeah but there we go but um yeah so you you are from um vast so yeah give us like who, who are you what does vast do why are we yeah sure <laughs> yeah absolutely so yeah um so from vast uh vast was founded by myself uh five years ago and um, we're basically in an e-commerce direct-to-consumer uh, consultancy, but we, in effect, run brands in the European or a wider MIA territory these days. Yep. So if we talk to a brand or approach, it's usually a US-based brand um, looking to establish themselves in the European market using digital and e-commerce. And we, we do the whole thing, all the way from the marketing side of things to the, the website design and build, but also um, all, to do, all the things to do with stock control, customer services, anything you need that you can imagine associated with um, with e-commerce and that actually extends to Amazon as well and actually right. saying the word Amazon and B Corp in the same word is always yeah. the one, so I'm <laughs> yeah. touching some of that because we've got yeah. a really interesting angle on it which could be could be hopefully of interest to you, to you guys for sure excellent yeah there's um we we do with um with all the clients that we work with uh, we do a kickoff session so we we basically get their whole team in the room and take them through a bit of a backstory like where did B Corp come from what is it why are you as a company doing it da 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 and one of the stats we always bring up in it to sort of demonstrate how B Corps are doing some good. So the average pay ratio in a B Corp is seven to one compared to a global average of 144 to one. So that's highest to lowest um, ratio, you know, pay, highest paid person, typically the CEO to lowest. Um, Jeff Bezos's highest to low ratio for him is 6,000 to one to his uh, lowest paid wow. worker. So that's always a good stat to bring up. Okay. So if, if, if you well, want to get yourself a, a vast rocket, um, you know, that. <laughs> You got to be happy for no plans to you. No, pl no plans yet. We'll just stick with yeah, going over the seven bridge in a car. Yeah. Yes, um, exactly. No, yeah. <laughs> so um, right, so that sounds so it's kind of like D to C in a box. By the sounds of it, it's kind of like hey, we yeah. want to get into the European market. You guys just help us do that. So how did you end up doing this? Like where where, where did you tell yeah. us? Like where, where did the journey start? Way back yonder. Um, yeah, it was way back, you know, and I, and I, and I should say um, I'm really fortunate in that the brands we work with, um, they all they, they all have really strong brand stories, and they they from they're kind of they're basically from the lifestyle sector, which aligns mm. very closely with what a lot of us do in the team. So a lot of us are surfers, we're mountain bikers, we yeah. have that inherent built-in love of the planet, and just want to look mm. after it and so on. So it's a real privilege to work with those brands. So that links into my wider story. So I um, yeah came out of uni, started designing websites as a thing on the side. Uh, while I was at uni, I yep. actually um, made quite a lot of cash out of it in that final year of uni. I think my actual nice. degree probably, probably um, <laughs> Suffered yeah, a little struggled bit. a bit as a result. <laughs> but you know, I was really, really lucky that I found something that I could do. So I did, I did just geography at uni, yep. which was more, um, I loved it, but it was never going to be a kind of a vocational application of it. Yep. So I was really lucky that um, I was able to find something that I could do on the last year of uni and then went into it and actually founded my first company back then, which was a, an agency called Yucca. Mm. And um, did that for 11 years, um, which is a long time. And that was a, more of a pure play digital agency, like that classic design and build, but also had a sort of a, a digital marketing side to it as well. Yeah. Um, we sold that to a large aim-listed um, marketing group. And I actually got headhunted by their, their biggest brand um, about six months into after the acquisition had happened. So I did this whole thing of mixing it, being going agency side and going client side, which is brilliant. I had experience um, where I went was actually on a private equity board. So to be able to witness firsthand as a CMO, the mechanics of how private equity works and how you raise money and all those kind of things in, the, in London was, was really, really great. Um, I then moved on to a surfer brand called Saltwalk and went on the whole very much on the kind of brand side of things. And I really observed that there was a challenge um, both agency side and brand side of 
disparate data systems, so dis systems not necessarily kind of talking to each other. So people weren't actually making the right decisions with the right data. Um, and also, you know, a kind of a lot of missed opportunity as a result of that really. So I had this idea while I was surfing, funny enough in Wales, in West Wales, I was literally paddling out a um, couple of duck dives and I just looked out to the ocean and literally sounds so cliche, but I just thought to myself, wow, it's vast out there. And literally that's where it came from. The opportunity, the idea that the, 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 um, the, the kind of digital and you know, e-commerce marketplace and landscape for brands literally is a vast opportunity if it's tapped correctly. And there's some big players out there that like the Amazons, the Assos's of this world who are having it away at the moment in terms of the use of big data, blending really advanced data sets together to get to basically optimize things like product margin and, and actually make the consumer experience better. And what we're all about is bringing the same kind of really sophisticated platforms that we've developed ourselves to the brands so they can not only keep up with Amazon and Asos and all those kind of guys, Zalando's, all those kind of big marketplaces, but leapfrog them and actually make the consumer experience better. And as I talk about very shortly, the kind of concept around delivering to the consumer the kind of B Corp promise and, and the idea that um, you can do good consumption. You don't necessarily have to just buy stuff. That's the key. Yeah. And that's the kind nice. of how I've ended up where we are now. So yeah, yeah. we're yeah, based in Bristol, UK, but we service, um, we've got, we've actually got um, brands as far as uh, New Zealand um, and Australia now. So we're running um, Yeti Australia and New Zealand down your way, which is really great. Nice. As, as in the, is that the mountain bike Yeti brand? No, it's the, as in the cooler, com uh, Texan cooler company, uh, oh, right. the drinkware and all that kind of right, stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, very cool. Well, it's good to, good to hear that Wales had a significant part in, uh, you know, in in the journey of, yeah. <laughs> of getting you. Absolutely. I think, yeah. I, think, I mean, it's so true. You know, the, you, I, in the you know in the winter here, I love my skiing, and for me, it's just that it's that space where you get to go and think, and you know, go with a couple of mates and talk talk crap and talk big ideas and and get that yep. fresh air. And yeah, I think it's a it's a vital part of. Um, of everything yeah i mean if, if you thought if you thought your degree was was a bit average and useless uh try medieval history which is what i chose um so wow uh, probably yeah. equally as kind of like what the hell are you going to do with that mate you know, i don't know yes <laughs> but we're here now hey <laughs> so yeah and it's no, definitely yeah we've got other similar backgrounds so yeah, yeah after sure. uni um my dad and i and a mate of mine from school we started a dot-com business but ours wasn't as successful as yours and um, we, we were trying to ride that wave of that sort of dot-com boom 98 99 you know put a dot com on the end find some private equity guys sell it for you know billions seemingly but yeah we never we never yeah. quite cracked that yeah. so yeah go you for doing that <laughs> yeah so, no, thanks yeah. so yeah okay so i guess the, or the big elephant in the room is you know d2c sell stuff um in a world of increasing people kind of questioning that and fast fashion and do we even need to buy anything um so yeah, yeah. To, uh, how are you tackling that you know and obviously this is a good this, bit right so bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 this is the good bit right so this is what really excites me and, it, and and it's yeah being really open right so we like i mentioned we're obviously um a, a team of outdoor enthusiasts so a lot of us obviously bike and surf and so on and um we've always had this kind of like um feeling of like slightly uncomfortable just by selling mm. selling stuff when perhaps people didn't always need to do it so um b corp uh, is an idea that we've had for a few years now and it's been amazing to actually implement it and it's given this framework for us to actually address some of those kind of challenges so for one thing i should explain so the idea of vast as well is that we've got this ready-made playbook that we can apply so when a when a new brand launches in territory we've already got all of the processes and the systems to be able to implement and then kushi continue to trade that brand in territory I mention it because what we're going to be doing and what we are starting to do is, is pepper that playbook with initiatives and those initiatives, we, we have to get opt-in from the brands to do it, yeah. but um, those initiatives actually start to make a difference when you actually start to apply them. So um, we've got three pillars to our kind of B Corp approach. Um, the first one is the kind of really stereotypical kind of application of sustainability in retail. And that's your bog standard switching out single use plastic packaging with compostable bags, um, you know, looking at um, the optimization of last mile um, in terms of are you using couriers that are using electric vehicles and, and all those kind of things. Those, those are the kind of like really obvious um, things that a lot of the brands are kind of starting to address because it's very, it's a very literal example to the consumer. Um, so that's the big one we're doing. That's a real, I actually think that's quite straightforward. Just big tick. A lot of the brands are already on that journey, but you'd be surprised 
some of the US brands, especially, are, are, there's less of a kind of um, disgust about the use of single use in that culture in, in the US mm -hmm. at the moment. So when they come over to, the, to Europe, they're actually quite shocked when they see how obsessed we are with recycling and, and, and single use um, reduction. So that's our first pillar. That's the kind of easy one, if you ask me. The next one is um, ethical advertising. So because we run Instagram, Facebook, all the, all the meta platform stuff, Google, all those kind of things, we are basically drafting an ethical advertising policy. And the concept here is um, because meta uh, and, and the like are, are kind of quite a long way behind the curve in terms of getting um, things like um, verification of age on, on accounts nailed, they're still, yep. still kind of been testing with that. We're um, having a whole element where Look, we, we, we can identify when it's a bit marginal, um, whether, that, whether that person you're targeting is actually of age. So we've got a, a whole sort of ethical policy piece that is, look, if you, if you want to opt in to you know, high brand, if you want to opt in to say 5 to 10% of your advertising next year to be within the realms of what we deem ethical, and that is basically no underage age advertising, not showing a sales message to someone more than, say, three or four times, or if the brand is really up for it, never showing them a sales message, for example. Mm. Um, and those are kind of big things that are going to basically, from a because this is the big thing about B Corp as well, is it's not just an, an environmental piece, it's actually engagement with wider society. Yep. And, and what, you know, and that, that's what we love the most about it in some senses, because it's really challenged us. Because not only are we potentially making people buy things they don't need, we're targeting in ways that are, isn't actually particularly ethical at times as well. So let's, ha let's open that conversation up in the industry and actually have a chat about it. And we're saying to our brands that, because when, say if a brand opts into say 10% of their advertising being ethical, there's a danger that potentially their top line revenue could come down slightly year on year. Mm -hmm. But if you forecast that, and that then leads to actually, in terms of our brand having purpose, this is what we're all about. This is us saying we're not going to be targeting people who shouldn't be targeted with this product. Right. And I think that's a big, a big kind of play for us. So that's um, something we're rolling out um, literally uh, as, of, as of next calendar, so ne next month. So that's a, a thing where we can go to all of our brands saying, what percentage of ethical advertising would you like to be opted into? And kind of go from there. And I think for us, you know, we're not claiming we've got all the answers, mm. but we are saying at the same time, let's work with the brands to work out a framework. And what excites us about B Corp as well is that once we're fully certified, um, we just love this idea that we'll be able to collaborate closer and closer with more and more B Corps yep. as well. Because there's yep. a bunch of brands out there who are B Corp, but their B Corp mission doesn't necessarily align with what, say, the e-commerce team's mission is. So e-commerce yep. mission often is sell. Just sell as much <clears throat> shit as you can, literally. And yep. you know, you do unethical things like use advertising in the best way you can to target people who perhaps can't afford the product or send a basket abandonment email that the perhaps they didn't need after the third time. All those kind of things, you know. Mm. So let's have the debate and actually join up disconnect between the B Corp, which is usually the marketing team from the e-commerce team or the wider kind of um, revenue commercial team. So these are really healthy debates. And then the third column um, of our, or third pillar, sorry, of our B Corp is um, basically data in retail. And this, because we, because we sit on these platforms, we can see things like um, obviously a customer who comes back in, we can see how much they spent. We can model when they're likely to repeat again with a brand. So it's called recency and frequency. Yep. And there's a whole piece there where we're, we're sort of going to say to the brands, it does it align with your brand mission to, to retarget this, this consumer this many times within, say, three months? And um, again, all these things have implications on top line revenue. And um, we want to, you know, our, our business model is we actually work on a percentage of the revenue we gain for the brands. So this, this concept of reducing volume and revenue actually hits our model as well. But if it's going to mean it's the start of something much bigger that's mm. going to affect the fundamental kind of operating system of retail, that's really compelling for us. So um, the last bit of data as well is that we look at full price markdown mix as well. And um, what that means is like the markdown side of things is the consumer is most at risk of buying something when it's marked down. Yep. So when it's on the discount, if they see, see a jacket um, that's suddenly 50% off that they've been holding back buying, they suddenly see it at that percentage off and they just buy it without just even thinking. It. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, you just do it. It's Apple Pay, click, <laughs> you're gone, you know? And it's, it's that sort of behavior. It's that behavioral fundamental change that's going to make a lot more difference than just changing the type of plastic you're using. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of bit that interests us the most because it's that kind of whole behavioral piece. 
Wow. Yeah, that's super cool. Super, super there you cool. Go. Yeah. And as you said that, the sun rose here in yeah. Bristol. <laughs> yeah, because someone's here coming up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So obviously, yeah, Richie's in uh, Bristol or Brizzle in the UK. Brizzle, yeah. And um, yeah, I'm obviously in New Zealand. So yeah, the sun's, I've closed my curtains. Is the sun where's it going? No, it's, it's pretty much gone down now here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you literally so, are on the other side of the world. <laughs> literally the other side of the planet. Yeah. yeah welcome to technology. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's super cool. Um, so, so many questions and thoughts bubbling around. Um, yeah, because I mean, have you have you worked or ha- did you become a student of marketing? Obviously, beyond geography, you've obviously learned a lot of you know this because because my background's in sales, and yeah, you know, the, some of the big things that you're taught in sales are, I guess, more of the tactical tools of influence. So there's like Robert Cialdini with his um, six tools of influence, which is, you know, scarcity and, uh, you know, liking um, and all these. Yeah. Kind of, well, I'll put a link to videos on him. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then there's also um, as part of my sort of journey of unbundling how I got to be who I was, which turned out to be not who I thought I should be, if that kind of makes sense within the purpose realm yeah. of stuff. Um. I got into learning, excuse me, about, um, oh, what's his name? Bernays, who, uh, I can't remember his first name. Edward Bernays, there we go, who was Sigmund Freud's nephew. Um, and he basically created modern marketing in its current um, sort of guise of understanding fundamentally that humans are driven by either fear or desire and if you know that you can market to them so that's where the whole scarcity is like well if you're scared that you're not going to get it buy it now there's only five left at this price they're going to yeah, be gone by tomorrow absolutely. and yeah. i don't think most people know i think people kind of know that they probably are being played but i don't think most people know actually the depth to which they are being played and how many tools both digital, emotional, psychological, you know, just even yeah. looking at how a supermarket is set up and how it's designed and how they use the music Absolutely. to keep in a positive frame of mind. And, you know, yep. I always say to people, look at, you know, look at how supermarkets run their offers because they have spent over the years, possibly billions of dollars making you buy that three for two pack of ramen that you don't actually need, but you end up buying yep. because it just looks too good to be true. Yeah. So it's Absolutely. really interesting that you're unbundling that um, because I think because that is the most powerful thing. Um, Absolutely, and, and, and I, us buy yeah, shit. yeah, no, hundred percent. And I think it's a really it's a really great example you, you've made there of of the tactics that are happening. And I think we're almost going to look. I'm, I'm convinced we're going to look back on this particular time we're looking in the dominance of social media, the addiction to smartphone, the addiction to screen mm-hmm. time, um, linked to the e-commerce world and consumption. As a time of like when you know literally they were they were still putting um class a drugs in coca-cola you know is that, yeah, is that yeah. it's like it's, it's I can't that believe they fundamental did that. yeah 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 it's, it's you can't believe they did it you know and it yeah. like and because it's the activation of dopamine it's this you know so it's this feeling better about things and i think there's obviously um the covid uh side of things accelerated so many things mm. and i think um e-commerce adoption happened even quicker but the dominance of social media more than ever especially on the, the younger generation is the thing we're so kind of cognizant of um the power of that tiktok algorithm and, and instagrams as well is is, is just mm. phenomenal but I, I think having an open debate i think the brands leaving it on the b corp side of things the ones with purpose obviously they're, they're all good about purpose if you're on b corp anyway but the one actually open that debate and go look you know what we haven't talked to you on Instagram today. You mm. already bought that jacket four weeks ago. You don't need it. Yeah, it's actually having an open discussion, and you could actually turn it on its head. And and people, everybody talks about if you want, you know, the 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 high yield from by being a B corp. You're going to hold on to your your teams longer. You're going to encourage yep. people to buy from you more quickly. I think the openness and honesty of a brand that talks that way is is far more compelling than just. And um, yeah, that's it. And it goes without saying, Tim, we don't work with fast fashion. So there you go. Yeah. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. We, we're only about that high yield kind of piece. Yeah. 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 Well, and because you're wearing your Patagonia jacket there and, and um, a mate of mine, uh, Tim Loftus, he did his, he's got, I think he's got two MBAs because he's really greedy and I'm pretty sure he's got two. And one of them he did in the US <laughs> and he was um, pretty close to the Patagonia team. And um, like when they were going through their, I think it was either just around their B Corp certification, which I think was like 20, uh, I want to say 2011, I think was when they got their B Corp. Anyway, um, 
and it was really interesting like, it, it, his research on them and, and seeing them and i think we've all seen this like their whole you know black friday don't buy our stuff go into the wilderness you know yep, actually absolutely has led to them being more successful over time than if they were you know just buy 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 and i guess yep. there's an interesting um yeah sort of side to that so, so there's a a b corp based in this region called Kathmandu. they they do sell into the uk christchurch based um with melbourne in, in australia as their sort of other regional hub and they used to be that kind of stack it high sell it cheap everything's half price like every weekend it's a sale and <clears throat> you know and you kind of just you buy into it and you think oh yeah it's good stuff and it, yeah give it a week it'll be on sale and they've completely tim was um instrumental in in their journey to to recognizing that actually that's just not cool you know for the planet long yep. term and actually if you transition to uh <clears throat> you know buy it once and keep it for as long as you can um that's better for everyone um totally yeah it is and, yeah. and fundamentally because and, and, one of our big sort of tenants is the concept of selling of, of building being brand equity for a brand and the way you, you the way you truly do that is is when a consumer is buying the product at full price with a view to keeping it for as long as you can um it's good better for the brand because you're not discounting they're buying they're buying it for the reason of the brand exists not because it's yep. discounted i think that's the I think that's the big disconnect and i think um yeah that for us it's we're already kind of pre b corp we already were used to selling in um full price brands anyway you know, using mm. the brand equity, you know, the, the brand promise as a way of mm. getting a consumer to go, I see the value of why I should spend an extra hundred pounds on this cooler versus, you know, this one over here that's a, you know, a, a, yeah. a lower brand in theory. Mm. But then when you add in all the tenants of B Corp and you go, actually, this is amazing because it's, it's giving, it's like putting fuel on it, you know, it, it's giving it genuine purpose. So I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's a really exciting time for sure. To be, as long as the brands are addressing it, that's the key. Yeah, and I think, I think increasingly it feels like fashion is, you know, and, and even consumer in general, you know, out of our client base currently, I haven't done the numbers for a while, but I get a sense that the vast majority are consumer brands, their health and beauty, yep. food and beverage, you know, clothing, you know, yeah, stuff, consumer brands rather than B2B service-based companies per se. And I think in most of those sectors, and of course, obviously in the UK, you've just hit the thousand b corp mark um yeah <clears throat> and i know the last time i looked at some sort of the global stats the vast majority by volume the, the highest number of b corps are in that consumer brands so yeah health and beauty food clothing um it, i think that you know they, they're at the pointy end of the wedge where consumers are all things being equal in the shop kind of going well hang on a minute yeah this one is better for the planet or i know that this one hasn't been made by six-year-olds in bangladesh and that's probably a good thing that i'm supporting that one rather than that one so yeah i think yep. it's um i think your timing is probably bang on i think you know if you if you'd launched this five years ago people probably be looking at you going you want us to sell less and you're going to get paid less for helping us sell less yeah mate do it's one <laughs> totally exactly I, I would be it would be generally you are a crazy hippie and that's that's exactly it and i, and I think um you are you've got and i think it uh I, the way I often talk about it is like each, if you imagine like each consumer, I'm convinced everybody's got their own mini personal B Corp. We're all trying to do, right? Yeah. So do, do I need to buy that jacket this year? Do I need another bike? Do I need a new surfboard? That's pop, that's my particular problem is surfboards. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's that, um, and, and, and yeah. And, and I think if you can find brands that will talk to you in that way, mm. you're then, and it's something about the UK market. It seemed to happen through COVID. There's a yeah. couple of brands over here, um, in particular that really emerged through COVID that have just nailed it with their comms. They, a couple have gone big up at that point. They've gone since as well. Mm. They just really kind of talk to the consumer that, it's, that this is how we're going to roll out. It's still got a few things as they grow and stuff, but I think, yeah. Um, I mean, it goes about saying like one of our bigger brands we work with, um, they're part of VF. Yep. VF, obviously the guys that own North Face, Vans, all those yeah, kind of yeah. guys. And um, we went through their very protracted procurement process, which is what you'd expect. Yep. And I like to think we were probably one of the last ones that got in mm. before the more the stricter, kind of um you know you've got to have a modern slavery policy you've got to have all these kind of yep. things that came in and all the great things about b corp is you just literally just go hey we've done this already yep. they can see it completely transparent and off you go we've, we've we've also done it on our business with um iso certifications as well yep. just a way a way of um demonstrating we can benchmark our level of data security we've got and all those kind of things but 
I think you're right. I mean, I think um, could have been, yeah, maybe yeah, three three to five years ago, people would have thought he's mad. Yeah. What's he, what are they thinking? <laughs> but but now it's it really really resonates with the brands when we talk about it. Mm. And I think and I think it's this. Yeah, I just I just love the concept of purpose. It's not just about the bottom line. Mm. And, and literally going to to think we could leave some kind of a small legacy that would be that would influence um, packaging changes or how data is used or how we engage with the likes of Meta. It's, it's really exciting. Mm. Have you, um, I don't know whether you would have come across it. So <clears throat> I did some work a few years ago with this. It was a Kiwi startup called Conscious Consumers, um, but they've now rebranded as Kogo. Um, and what they're doing now is helping consumers track their carbon footprint through their spending. So they, they've they created yeah. like a, a piece of tech that connects to banking software so that you can easily track your carbon footprint through what you've bought (coughs) excuse me but where they started and this might be a call i might see if i can introduce you to ben their ceo um or their uk team because they've got a uk team now um they started off doing consumer insights for brands to understand what the customers cared about and i wonder if that's something that you could almost layer onto your so so the idea was um, as a consumer i would link my credit and debit cards to their app securely and then on their app, I would say, I care about uh, companies paying a living wage. I care about if it's a food brand, I want um, animal cruelty free products. So I want, you know, free range chicken or or free range eggs, what have you. Um, I'm interested in uh, reducing plastic usage. I, there was, I think there was, in the end, there's about 15 or 20 things that you could sort of say, this is what I care about. And so the retailer would get insights as to who cares about what buying stuff in their store and then the consumer Amazing. would get insights to say hey did you know there's this shop that's 400 meters down from where you live um who sells stuff that you care about so the whole idea which is why they initially called it conscious consumers was like let's link people who know what they care about to the brands that can you know prove that they care about that and and sort of create a bit of a i guess like a, a positive arms race of uh, conscious consumerism but yeah i wonder if that's something whether Ben's still got, I don't know. I don't think it's in his playbook plan. Like I say, he's gone all in on the carbon tracking through banking data. Yeah, but that that could be a really interesting thing for you to then, you know, as an extra layer on the for the um, because I think I think you sort of mentioned it yourself. People, inc- I think the brands, companies increasingly want to do more good, but people don't always know what good to do, and yep feeling you know we've talked about it on a couple of recent episodes of the podcast you know there's green washing but there's also green hushing where people are fearful to talk about stuff that they are doing or they want to do for fear that people go yeah but it's not perfect or you know you're doing it slightly wrong and so i, I wonder yep. you, you i think you've got a really interesting because clearly you, you, you're connecting and i presume you get you've got consumer data that you're, you're holding at some level yeah yeah you've huge, got a, huge amounts yeah you've got yeah. a really powerful tool there to sort of get that feedback to the brands and go, actually, do you know what? This is what this group of consumers who are already buying your stuff, this is what they want. So go make it. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And we, and we, we already, <laughs> um, with the brands that we've been working with for longer, we, we kind of infer their, um, some of their product strategy as a European market is so, so different. And quite early on, um, one of our brands about two years ago, actually, Um, the packaging had to. So, um, yeah, did, did I lose you there, Tim? You yeah, there? we lost. Yeah, lost oh, yeah. you just for a second. Yeah, sorry. No worries. So, yeah, one, one of our brands about two years ago, um, they we had some feedback from our European consumer that there was too much plastic in the packaging. So, in their hook in particular on their packaging, right. yep. fed that back to them. They reduced it by it's about eighty percent reduction in plastic, which is huge um, when you when you scale it up and so mm. on. So. That kind of loop is really powerful and being able to influence the, the, the US brands in this way then has a knock on effect that they're, they actually adopted the same packaging change in their US territory, where there's obviously a, a heck of a lot more volume. Yep. So that that's a great example. But yeah, your yeah, your connection there, that sounds really good. And using what we want to do, because again, using this the KPI metrics that kind of benchmarking that B Corp's gonna make us do, feeding that back to our brands and saying, look, we we hit this KPI. If you do this, this this next quarter we think we're going to get this bit closer we yeah. actually think that's a really kind of compelling thing to be able to talk to brands about uh because we, we obviously talk about our normal kpis are linked to revenue obviously yeah but um and, and and often revenue but the efficiency of the margin on that revenue as well so adding all, all the other metrics as well that are to do with purpose and ethical um, advertising all that kind of stuff is going to make a real big difference 
Nice. Tail. So you, you, you can yeah. you can be a, a tail wagging quite a few dogs um, in that regard. Totally. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, and it, hopefully it might change their mindset because I think you said it. I mean, I've never heard a green hushing before, which is really interesting because I think that happens a lot. And I think mm. um, I think people are scared. They are, yeah. they are they are concerned sometimes to go. Oh, this is our initiative. Just because it's going well, what about all the other things you're doing that aren't quite right? You know, and that, and I know there's 100%. been a lot of um, hoo ha with the Nespresso's in this world, for example, yep. joining B Corp. You know, yep. oh, don't, mention, don't mention the N word. At least they've Shh, jo- no, not the N word. What is that? I know, but hey, but at least they've joined it. At least <laughs> we can see what they're now doing. You know, it's, yeah. so it, it starts yeah. that journey. And I think for, for me, what I've enjoyed about it is, um, yeah, I, I've enjoyed this feeling of like going, cool, we're doing something. We started yeah. something. It's not. We're not just going, hey, let's offset our air travel. It's way more than that, you know? That's the thing. And yeah, I I agree. I, and I wrote a pretty long blog post about the Nespresso stuff. I've even I've spoken to, um, I think it's Stefan, the New Zealand CEO. I kind of, after the dust, oh, really? <laughs> after the dust had settled, I sent him an email like, are you all right? <laughs> like, it's mixed yeah. results <laughs> on, the, on the news. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm hoping to get him as a guest on the podcast to sort of, you know, let's let's talk about it. But you know, when I when I met with him, yeah. again, it's really interesting. You know, that they're you know being a Swiss based company. What what they say is actually their you know their pod has a perfect amount of coffee, which uses the minimum amount of water possible to make the coffee. So overall, it's potentially less emissions, less waste, less you know product use in terms of input materials than a barista made coffee. So all of a sudden, you know, you get into the nitty gritty of well which is better than which and who's better than it's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's absolutely. It, 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 I think there are very few black and white answers when it comes to doing more good. Um, and yeah. as I've, I say frequently, you know, there is no 200 point B Corp. No one has won B Corp and gone, we've done it. We've created the world's perfect business. There is nothing more for anyone yeah. to do like we've won it. So <clears throat> it is a journey and I'd much rather people, are authentically talking about what they're trying to do and going through that rather than, you know, yeah, we've got some recycle bins and uh, yeah, we've, we pay to offset our carbon when we fly all around the world all the time. That's um, yeah. You know, be, be authentic, go on the journey. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Much more than that. No, definitely. Yeah. So how did you um, hear about B Corp? I, and, and I, I, oh, sorry, there you go. So I, I became aware of it. Yeah, I became aware of it mostly through, um, but actually through my through the brand the brands that I buy from, and because we're heavily into the the kind of out, outdoor lifestyle kind of retail area anyway, yeah. I became more and more aware of it. I think um, I'm trying to think because there's quite a, there's quite a B Corp community here in Bristol as well, so there's quite a lot yeah. of business leaders that are always talking about it as well. Um, and I think I think it also came up via some of the HR channels as well because. What's not talked about as much is that it actually the engagement, the internal engagement you can get from your own teams when they realize they can seize some initiatives and propose initiatives on having thought about doing this. That's when you really start to get that exciting you know, innovation and traction. So I think it kind of came in through the HR channels as a way of going, hey, look, you can hold on to you can retain people as well. You're not just um, putting stuff in bags and selling stuff to things people don't need. You're actually going, yeah, there's an ethical <coughs> angle to what we're doing dare I say ethical e-commerce and start all that kind of thinking really. <laughs> yeah. And and that's why, you know, like we were talking before we sort of went live. Um, we're, we're really big, the clients we work with on, on running, we call it the kickoff session. We get all your employees to come and sit in on an interactive workshop where we explain to everyone, where did B Corp come from? What is it? Why do you want to do it as a company? What are some B Corps doing some cool stuff? What's driving the rise of B Corp? Because that's, you know, frequently, it, 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 you know, well, people who, who are regular listeners might know. And and if, if you hang out with me enough, you, you might know that CFOs and accountants, I do give them the odd little bit of, eh, you know, it's mainly because I hate numbers um, and I really hate zero and any kind of accounting tool and trying to understand numbers. Yeah, not my not my bag. Um but um, I forgot where I was going now. See, they, see, this is what accountants do. They send me on a, on a rampage and then I uh, forget what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, oh, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> so you do talk about B Corp. Yeah. 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 So you about it? Yeah. Um, quite often when some people kind of go, yeah, but how much is this? How much is the certification going to cost us every year? And my reply to that is spread that cost over your HR budget, your marketing budget and your operations budget. And if you don't get at least your money back 
from each of those channels in terms of the investment and bearing in mind that the highest fee you'll pay is about 60 grand i think and that's if you're almost like a billion dollar plus business so if, if you can't like, yeah as exactly said you know save that one employee that is actually the one that you really need to save from walking by getting them engaged on this process or if you can't hire the next best talent because you're a b corp and there's data and evidence that shows that and if, if you want to that just click on the link to download the ebook and all the links that are around the universe that we place wherever this podcast goes you know there's just data up the wazoo that shows that employees want to come and work for b corps <clears throat> and then you haven't even engaged your customers yet or any of your other stakeholders so yeah i i just think if you if you don't leverage the b corp journey internally to begin with it's like you you've wasted your time oh yeah no no definitely and I, I'm, I'm sort of excited to see where we are in like a year's time when when the team really kind of got their head because we, we have this value when our, our core company value is um relentless r d so everybody mm. contributes to our roadmap because we've got our own platforms we're really yeah. lucky we can go okay let's just let's just knock out this idea and see how it works test and learn from it we could easily do that sort of stuff with you know to do with our b core pillars and i think mm. seeing the team engaging with it and going forward with it and getting once they understand fully that they can go wow we can start to make a difference especially the volumes that we're shifting that's going to be really exciting. And that, that's the bit for me is that's going to be, yeah, this, this is next level. Should mm. I talk about Amazon really quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the, other, that's the, small, that's the that. small elephant in the room. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we do engage with Amazon and, and we run um, the marketplace channel uh, for Amazon. We also run uh, run it on some smaller uh, marketplaces as well. Because Amazon is very big in UK, but it's not so big in places like France. It's mm. actually frowned upon even more in France, probably because of the tax situation, but anyway. Um, and we, we engage with Amazon because we, we, we employ or deploy a, a concept of a, like a product segmentation. So you'll go to some of these marketplaces. This is what all the brands do. You won't always see the latest new in product on the marketplaces. It's usually you have to go to the direct D2C e-commerce site to see the, like the, new, the latest new in season product. And um, for us, we actually think we can constrain potential top line volume um, uh, via the Amazon channel by having a direct channel that's got the latest assortment on it so that if that makes sense we're actually going to be reducing a, it's a vital new to brand channel for all our brands mm. but in theory once we've got them on the on the in, into the brand they're more likely to repeat via the direct channel anyway so if you imagine we're actually going to be taking product sales and volume away from those marketplaces into ones that are more the direct the direct channel itself and if it's yeah that that's um quite an interesting one because it's potentially getting people out of the Amazon ecosystem who only shop in the app are actually going to go onto the direct channel instead for the first time at times. So there's a bit of an angle there as well. Um, even though, nice. you know, to be fair to Amazon, they are doing a huge amount. Mm. Yeah. So you, you're basically creating like a storefront on your platform, but it, it looks like the brands. Would that be how I would interact with it if I was so, to, to get something? Yes, yeah, so if you bought from any of our brands, if you bought from an Amazon from the Amazon side of things, you could then go to the once if you wanted to buy it again, you could go to just the normal direct brand site and buy it that way. And right. there's a higher chance they're gonna that's what they're gonna as opposed to going back to Amazon. Yeah. So that's that's our, our kind of our kind of hook that demonstrates yep. that um we're gonna be reducing volumes on those marketplaces as a result because they're going back to the direct side of the brand. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of thinking that's in, yeah. involved in that. That, yeah, that's Sorry. all about not making sure. Yeah, it's all about making sure you're not stopping the latest, the new in stuff that's on the direct Amazon channel. That's the key. Yeah, yeah. So it's to keep that kind of powder dry um, on your own store. Yes, um, yeah. And bringing people there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because, I mean, it is interesting just thinking about, um, thinking about some of the brands here. I guess, uh, do you know the brand Etique? So they're uh, like a solid bar health and beauty product. Um, they're right. they're yeah. not D2C so much in the UK. Um, but that was their um, so Brianne founder that that was her her initial play was D 2 C online store built up credibility built up a huge fan base um, and then was kind of like hey supermarkets hey pharmacies hey I think they stopped in um, Holland and Barrett in the UK places like that you know <clears throat> she had that credibility had the sales to say look actually people want this you know now you should perhaps yep. consider stocking it. Um, yeah, and, and there's definitely a lot of the brands that we're helping with B Corp at the minute, like the consumer brands, they are pretty much predominantly D2C, um, which is interesting. 
the the, the whole because because i mean d2c how long has d2c even been a thing in terms of e-commerce i mean it's it, it can't have been that long yeah um, I, it's 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 not it's a relatively new thing um because yeah. there's always been this nervousness from the brands about we need to need to not potentially undercut the, the direct retail channel yeah because that there's a real traditional thing that's formed on long-term relationships and stuff and i think the lifestyle sector that we are prim- primarily operate in as well has almost been one of the last kind of verticals to adopt that mm. um other other areas d to c happen really quickly and everybody just went yeah cool that's just what we do we buy direct um but yeah i think yeah there's been a, there's been a, a, a sort of lull uh, mm. probably a, probably led by the generational sort of uh yep. reflection of the fact that, that some of the people in management might have been a bit older and not so familiar with direct channel you know techniques yes yeah, so i think yeah but it feels like the flood the floodgates are definitely opening now mm. i think increasingly and i think a lot a lot of the brands we bring to market now they go we're going to go d to first that's what they say whereas yep. five years ago it was let's open wholesale first then direct to consumer yeah yeah so it's definitely sort of, turn around sort of you use the stores and the retail reach to get access and then try and get better margin by getting people going direct <clears throat> um yeah that's, one of our that's other... the plan. I, mean, I mean the, the, the there's always yeah there's always going to be a place for the, re, the those retailers because the theater of being able to check out and go to um actually fill the product yeah see the sizing all that kind of stuff is always going to be yep. something they're going to need to do for a brand yeah, yeah. But I think the yeah, there's a whole swathe that you can definitely just get to the diet brand now, definitely. Yeah. And I definitely, um, you know, one of our other recent clients, Genora, so they, they're like a um, skincare uh, health brand, basically built D2C. And I think what they were really smart about, I guess this is what the D2C angle gives you. And it's p- possibly the same with a teak, but um, <laughs> possibly le- less so. Genora, really big on community. Um, you know, so around their Instagram channel, they've created community. And, you know, if you've got that D to C and they rely so much on that community feedback, you know, they, they like, Hey, we, 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 we're going to test this thing, you know, who wants to try it? And literally uh, they launched some new, there's like a, um, like a, how do you call them? Like one of those health supplements. It's in a, I think it was in a hot chocolate drink. That's got, you know, like, um, extracts to help you go to sleep at night. And, I think they, you know, they had, they had yeah. like 150 units and they sold within I don't know, like 10 minutes or something, you know, as a tester range. And then they did sort of another 150 and they'd sold straight away. As so having that conversation direct with the, with the consumer for purpose driven brands, I think is really critical. Um, Cause you get that direct feedback and you can test and you, and you can, and, and again, I think what, you know, Genora and Atik have done exceptionally well as examples of purpose driven brands is, is just having that authentic conversation and saying, look, we're not, we're not perfect, but, we're trying our best and we want to know what, how you want to do it. Um, yeah. Do, do you, yeah. Find, are you finding also that the D to C Avenue, because one thing you hear, and I've obviously I've got no, no direct experience of selling in retail, but you know, you often hear that um, suppliers get pretty screwed by the big re, big box retailers. You know, it's all about margin. And, you know, if you're not selling units, you're going to be dropped as a skew next week. So, you know, and then you hear stories about them having to pay the retailer for you know for being on the the aisle or the height of the aisle that they should be on to get the most sales in it yeah it all sounds a little bit eh, I'm not sure i'd want to be involved in that kind of stuff it seems yes. so complicated um so I presume there's a bit more transparency yeah. in terms of what you can offer a brand as well oh hugely yeah i mean and, and if you ever get to the point I, I think that's almost like a worst case scenario for a brand to get to the point where you're um being pushed around in that way by by your by your sort of uh, retail channel, uh, especially you know because that's that's volume versus margin piece. And if you're openly having to have that debate with your biggest supplier, that's not a good sign. So yeah, we I think the level of control that a brand gets by having a kind of DC led or DC first kind of approach is what the big attraction is. And one of the big brands that really pioneered a lot of this stuff is Nike. Mm. And Nike um, were very very reliant on those big box, those big kind of um, you know, top echelon kind of shoe retailers. And um, they took a risk, like probably they, they started the debate really openly, probably seven, eight years ago saying, you know what guys, our latest designs, our latest new in, we're not actually going to give them to you anymore. We're going to put them straight on our direct site. You can stock them after say three or four months, but we want our direct site to be the place you go to experience Nike um, and to buy the latest product. And that's and that's a form of segmentation. That was the early stages mm-hmm. of segmentation that we're now seeing across the industry as a whole. But I think that was a real bold move, and they knew they were going to lose sales in those mm-hmm. first few months. 
or first few years because those big boxes will be dialing back Nike and almost making pay for it. Yeah. And actually, ironically, um, the Adidas of this world then muscled in and kind of stole some of that volume. But now the um, effectiveness of that Nike direct channel is so, so good. They now control the margin and they control the consumer in the sense that they own that, so you get the consumer to opt in, which is the other big challenge we've all got, especially in Europe with our GDPR legislation. Mm. Um, as long as they opt in, you've got that, you, you're then in the driving seat to be able to get that consumer to repeat. And like you say, have that direct dialogue. I mean, we call it um, direct for consumer, that dialogue piece. Mm. There is this kind of centricity towards the consumer that um, the Amazons of this world, for example, in their more commoditized approach, and even a supermarket, they don't have that relationship. Whereas using digital yeah. channels, email, and the response back and stuff, you can create these really great, you can create these like value adding relationship, which is what we're looking to do. Mm, totally. Yeah, I heard a story, um, a mate of mine, he runs uh, a, a pretty large, well, decent sized research company here in New Zealand. And he was talking about how one of their clients, you know, flew to the UK, um, you know, brand, you know, I'm not sure whether it's food or beverage or, or what the exact product was. But they flew to the UK to have a meeting with one of the big supermarkets who they were stocked in, uh, to you know to try and negotiate terms and you know get better margin, I guess. And um, the the, you know, the classic uh, big corporate um, customer, you know, he he walks into the room on his own, slightly jet lagged, having just got in from New Zealand. And there's kind of like five people, uh, you know, around the table from from the uh, from the uh, supermarket chain. And the opening gambit from the CFO was, you know, oh, hey, Richie, so it's 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 great that you're here. Um, I was actually just looking at the numbers and um, you account for 0.0001% of our revenue. I just thought that was an interesting number. Anyway, um, what is it you'd like to talk about? <laughs> and the guy was like, wow. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think we're done here. <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, wow. like, if if that it's, 0. Yeah, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.001% is one hundred percent yours, uh, it's good. Yeah. I can have a conversation yeah. with my customers, and, and away we go. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, we definitely yeah, we've got no, a few definitely. and a few of our brands who are they're negotiating that D to C, and we will need to try and get into the into the supermarket or um, other retailers so that we can, you know, get some exposure. It's tough, man. Yeah, it's really tough. And I think I think the most important thing is before you even engage with, it, say, a supermarket, is having that direct channel nailed already, understanding the, the exact, you know, the customer profile of who you're targeting. And um, we have to say, don't even, you, sometimes you might not even need to engage with a supermarket because that's not your target audience anyway. Yeah, yeah. If you want to find yeah. loads of other people over here, like if you want to grow this yeah. pot, of, pot, pot of people, you might be able to invest in you know, a podcast, for example, <laughs> that will get you, yeah, loads, yeah. Lo you know, many more listeners or viewers than say yeah. just just you know hem hemorrhaging margin and being shown up in the wrong place because I think that's the other thing as well is there's um the big thing we we've got as well is we've got a really strong handle on the wholesale channel and retail mm. about whether it's actually driving brand equity for a brand as well mm. so that's a particularly powerful tool as well because um we often I want that people compete with people that stock the same product mm. and um if they're bidding on say Google brand terms they're wasting money to protect their brand terms so we've got a whole model that also gives that insight to the brand as well. You, and you only get that if you've got a direct consumer um, play live. And yeah. some brands, most do now, but some do, but they're very under-optimized as we all know, mm. which is why Vast exists back to the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. And so um, I guess just sort of finishing up, think going, going back to your, you know, your, like I say, you're, you're on, on the journey, you're almost, you know, at the point of getting into the submission stage for your B Corp, but any anything that jumped out of you or jumped out at you in terms of like okay wasn't expecting that you know wasn't expecting a question around that um yeah yeah i think i think um i think the, one of the surprises has been the sheer number of policies we've had to generate which is understandable <laughs> um yeah there's a lot of policies we didn't have and we thought we were doing pretty well with policies because we've gone through yep. iso 27001 in particular we're doing another yep. iso um environmental management as part of the, yeah. the B Corp as well that's going to improve those areas. Um, I think the, yeah, some of the questions, because we, we've actually got a higher than normal industry average female component of our um, right. development team. Yep. And that's just kind of happened, just mm -hmm. kind of, it's brilliant. And um, I think for us, the one that jumped out of us is we're, we're really keen to now maintain that and put that yep. put that as a, a thing we, we, we drive forwards. Yep. And we're looking to overflow some of our development um, to Pakistan. I was actually in Pakistan earlier this year 
um, uh, and, and you know, meeting with our existing um, uh, developers and so on about how we can scale up and increase our volume out there. Mm. But extending our kind of B Corp methodology around making sure that we've got a, a, a decent gender representation yep. with our suppliers as well. And that's, that's, you know, challenging in a place like Pakistan where I think I've only got one female member of the Air Force, for example, you know. Right. So it's, that's going to be cool. And I think those sort of questions that come up as well, where we can mm. challenge and, and, and leverage it as well. I think that's probably the biggest one. What's, what's the other one? Um, yeah, obviously, the modern slavery side of things, yep. making sure we're all sorted on that one. That was that was good to have it all ticked off. And I think um, transparently talking to our team about where we're at and what we're doing has been has been one of the big benefits as well. Mm, nice. And plans for the future? What is obviously the future is vast, uh, just like that endless Indeed, yeah. sea looking west yes. past Ireland to uh, to North America. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's we carry on. We're going to carry on driving. We've got a big push in mainland Europe at the moment, having some great success uh, with the brands on the mainland at the moment. So we're going to carry on driving that forward. But I think what's interesting is increasingly we're being asked to run our model um, in the US. So right. I think uh, going back the other way either with um, European brands into the US or just running US brands, that's yep. going to be a kind of likely next step. Yep. Um, so I'm over there in uh, Q1 next year and start to kind of kick off some of those discussions as well. So nice. we might as well do it because the great oh, thing yeah. is the more brands we do, the more, more application of kind of the B, B Corp pillars and methodology we can get going there, it's going to help the planet, which is what will happen. Nice. Super cool. And you're looking for any key yeah. brands? Like I said, there's a few people that we're working with who... I know they've got Always. one eye on uh, getting over yeah. to the other side of the planet. So um, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, we'll hook you up. Yeah, the the traditional the traditional barriers of why people think they can't enter territory, um, we get over because of our model, because we've yeah. already got like a ready made way of working. It's this perception um, you need a, usually about a million uh, GBP to set up a local team. Yeah. So we've already got that local team. So it's nothing like that to set up with us, mm. and you can just test and learn. And yeah, um, yeah. this is sure the great works. thing, you know. You might get like a sweet vein that works really well with consumers that go, well, yeah, I mean, I, cause I, I used to buy my mountain bike kit from a brand down in New Zealand. Right. Cause the, 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 the yeah. And it, it was Which one was that? Oh, I can't remember. Oh, I'm trying to remember who they are now. Is it NZO? Oh, they were dope. NZO no. or ground, ground effect? Ground effects. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So they're, effects. they're in Christchurch. Yeah. 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 Just no way. around the corner from where I am. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's a, such good product and they, they yeah. can fly in this territory. So, cause they've got, um, they used to put fleece on the kneecaps. Yeah, yeah. The only, only leg leggings I had with fleece on the kneecaps. And that's great for this country that's absolutely freezing, especially right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, Minus two outside. I'll drop them a note and say, hey, because I'm on their, yeah. I'm on their uh, email list. Um, oh, amazing. I, I've, okay, said yeah, no, I, I've said to them, I've said to them, you guys should be a B Corp because I think you'll smash it because there's not really that many mountain yeah. bike brands that are B Corp. And yeah. your, their whole ethos is buy it once, buy good quality, will kind of fix it if it goes wrong which there's quite yeah. an ethos of that you know because um there was a brand here mac pack was still here back in the day you know it was it was run by it was almost like a bit of a mini uh patagonia owned by a guy um who was into the outdoors and their whole policy was if it breaks doesn't matter if it's 25 years old we'll fix it um and now it's been yeah. bought out by private equity and then it's been bought out by some big aussie based commercial assets and it's kind of like yeah, you can just see the quality is going, you know, down and down and down. So, um, but yeah, yeah. Mac Pack and um, uh, yeah, Ground Effect, they, they kind of used to be like, well, Ground Effect still is. Yeah, I'll, I'll drop them a note. We'll see if we can connect you and- uh, Do, some, amazing, that'd be ace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you- um, That's awesome. You, you out for a surf this morning or is it a bit, bit too cold? <laughs> so uh, to, uh, I'll be going, I go on Friday. So we're really lucky. We've got one of the wave pools here in Bristol. Oh, so nice. a, a, yeah, yeah. It's called the wave. It's using the wave garden code technology. So yeah. um, it's great. It's They've just uh, got sign off on solar power as well. Oh, nice. So you can get there, plug plug your EV in, and then yeah. have a, a carbon neutral surf as well. So nice. it's all power, but it's going to be power. Out. So it's, that, that's why I go every Friday, which is amazing here in Bristol. But I was in the ocean last week. That was good. Bit chilly. Bit big. A bit, bigger, it's a bit not chilly. that cold yet, but no. you're not. It's colder in the wave pool than it is in the ocean still. It's done, no ice cream headaches yet, which is <laughs> nice. Good. You need to go and put 50p in the uh, in the meter of the wave machine to get the temperature up. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd be so good if they heat it. Oh my goodness. Nice. Yeah, yeah there's, there's plans for one here, actually, um, just north of Christchurch. Um, a whole Brilliant. big, yeah, sort of aquatic centre. Um, I'm not sure where, yeah. my mate of mine, Scott, um, he was on the board of it. I don't know what's happened. I haven't seen him for a while. Um, yeah, but yeah, me and surfing. 
tried it a couple of times. I'm I'm six foot four, 120 kilos. I, I call it BMS, big man syndrome. Anything that involves right. like heaps of balance. I mean, I like skiing, but you know, you just point them down the mountain and kind of go for it. Um, but yeah. yeah, anything that's sort of a bit delicate and needs a bit of balance. Um, although yeah, I don't know, maybe I should give give uh, surfing another go. I'm doing better at my skiing. Yeah, over the last just few get, years. get a huge board. Well, that's what I need. I need like and you'll go. You know, <laughs> I need, I need <laughs> one of those original like Hawaiian like eighteen or sixteen hundreds like half a tree. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm likewise. I've, I've always wanted to come down your way and surf the, the likes of Raglan and it's on the bucket list so nice. it's going to happen at some point well yeah. let us know mate we'd be more than happy to, we'll you know, to host you and you could go and stay uh, with the Raglan Coconut um, company team based in Raglan who are a B Corp um, undoubtedly um, there's, 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 okay cool R- Raglan is a town of not that many people and there's two B Corps there that, that per capita I, I think they must be just be smashing it on a global level like highest number of yes. B Corps yeah they would <laughs> <laughs> so amazing um, and yeah, and proximity to world class point breaks, so that's amazing. Yeah, here we go. Here yeah, we go. cool. Well, mate, it's, it's been really good to uh, to meet you, catch up, and learn more about what you're doing. We will definitely, um, yeah, be introducing you to some of our our clients, I think. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd be really keen. Let us know what B Corp score you get. We'll keep a lookout. But yeah, yeah. as soon as you know, let us know. And um, yeah, when you come when you come to New Zealand, shout out. Be, we'll have, we'll kind of a sure, cheeky definitely. cheeky beer. Definitely. No, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, yeah, and thank, thanks for logging in in the middle of your night or whenever it is at your time. And, uh, <laughs> 10 o'clock. Yeah, it's coming up to 10 p.m. Oh, okay, cool. Good. All right. But yeah, no, definitely. I'll give you a shout for sure once we've got our score. That'd be great. Awesome. All right, mate. Amazing. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tim. Hey, it's Tim here, that B Corp bloke from Grow Good. If you want more content on purpose, B Corp, how to do more good in the world as an individual or a business, then you know the drill. Hit the like and subscribe. Check out some of my other videos. They're probably floating around here somewhere. You know how it works. Thank you so much. See you next time.